pleased to introduce Dr. Jonathan Kill this morning. Uh, he studied at uh, UC Irvine, I believe, and then continued on at Georgetown as well as uh, UVA, uh, where um, I believe you completed your doctorate degrees. Uh, and after um, a stint at uh, a couple of companies, um, you eventually founded uh, SPI. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, a technology that has really shown significant promise in helping patients with uh, Meniere's disease. <clears throat> so uh, I look forward to hearing what you're going to uh, tell us about it today. Oh, very good. So thank you again, everyone, for uh, attending. And thank you, the House Foundation, for um uh, asking me to present during your ground rounds. So I'll look to share screen now. All right. So um, I'm happy to keep this uh, presentation very casual. So if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, ask them as we go along. And then at the end, um, I'm happy to entertain uh, any questions. Uh, this presentation should only take, uh, I think, about 30 minutes maybe 35 minutes to progress through. And um, hopefully uh, you'll find it uh, educational as well as uh, promising. So with that, um, this first slide shows you our neuroautology pipeline. And the blue bars indicate indications where we think Epsilon, SPI 1005, uh, can be a successful monotherapy. So we've tested in acute noise-induced hearing loss and now two Meniere's disease trials. The green bars indicate INDs in aminoglycoside and platinum-based ototoxicity, where we think we may need to complex uh, Epsilon with another compound or even particularly the uh, offending agent, uh, combining uh, epsilon with aminoglycoside or platinum. And then finally, we do have a regenerative program uh, involving P27 TIP1 inhibition. This is uh, a pathway that I co-discovered with Hubert Lowenheim when I was at the University of Washington in the Department of Otolaryngology, collaborating with Fred Hunch scientists. So epsilon is a small molecule. It's a new chemical entity, an NCE. We have it uh, active in four INDs focused on neurotology and one IND focused on COVID-19 of all things. And the selenonitrile imidazole ring structure in that small molecule is unique. So epsilon broadly is an anti-inflammatory. Uh, we think it's very good for neuroinflammation. And um, as an anti-inflammatory, it's demonstrated strong safety. We don't have the side effects of common anti-inflammatories, and we don't have drug-drug interactions documented to date. In its current formulation, SPI 1005 is dosed orally twice a day, and we've been dosing patients for as little as four days, up to 28 days. And now with our pivotal phase three in Meniere's disease, patients have been rolling over into an open label extension for safety for uh, six and up to 12 months. So with SPI 1005, we completed six randomized control trials. We've supported two other RCTs and we have five ongoing treatment-resistant depression. In the cystic fibrosis uh, study population involving aminoglycoside ototoxicity, two small phase twos involving uh, moderate and severe COVID-19, and then our pivotal phase three in Meniere's disease. So this next slide comes from a publication where we documented the effects of uh, intense noise on the rat cochlea. So these three micrographs show you immunofluorescence of a GPX-1 antibody. So epsilon has two mechanisms of action, or at least two, two that we think are neuro or autoprotective. One is as a glutathione peroxidase-1 mimic, 
through that seleno nitro imidazolving. The other is under redox stress, it can induce GPX1 transcriptionally. So in this experiment, animals were exposed to octave band noise for four hours, 113 dB SPL. This creates a significant uh, temporary threshold shift on the order of about 50 decibels one day post. That resolves to a, a PTS of about 15 decibels a one month post. And what we've been showing with uh, low oral doses starting one day before the noise was a reduction in TTS. And other independent labs had shown this as well, including Tatsuya Yamasoba at the University of Tokyo. So we wanted to know what was happening there. Uh, so we, in this experiment or series of experiments, we sacrificed the animals within hours of that noise exposure. We didn't carry them through for one week, one month. And in B, what we found was striol edema. We found evidence that uh, Reisner's membrane was ruptured. And in C, that's the autoprotective effect of epsilon. So now the stria is, is not swollen. Uh, Reisner's membrane is often bulging, uh, but not broken. And when we quantified the level of GPX1 immunofluorescence during these three different conditions, we found that uh, in C or the red bar, that there was an induction. Uh, GPX1 expression at baseline in A is represented in the blue bar. And immediately after noise, it goes down. And then uh, with epsilon uh, pretreatment, it goes up. So with as little as one to three doses before an intense noise exposure, we and others have shown a significant photoprotection. In addition, um, when we saw these micrographs uh, as we were getting ready for publication, I made the comment, can't we find any in B, the B condition, where Reisner's membrane is intact? And our scientists said, no, after a noise within hours, many of them look like this. So then I went through every serial section. And one of the things I noted was uh, this change in strial edema. And then we had someone independently blinded quantify the GPX1 expression. So we were convinced that uh, epsilon was working in the acute period and many different sensory neural structures within the cochlea. And this also gave us some idea or hope that it could help with uh, in years disease. All right. Let's see here. All right. It seems to be having some difficulty advancing my slides. Okay, there we go. Um, this next slide shows you the abstracts from two bodies of work. On the left is the abstract from the 2017 Lancet paper. We tested epsilon in a young adult college age uh, study pop with Colleen Laprell and Pat Antonelli at the University of Florida. It resulted in an 11 page research article. And here we were testing the idea that epsilon could be autoprotective against uh, noise induced hearing loss. On the right hand side is our <clears throat> first uh, presentation of the uh, phase 2B work in the Nears disease across multiple centers in the US. So on slide six, you can see the consort flow diagram of the phase 2A study, the 202 study involving the University of Florida population. So we um, screened 160 
patients for eligibility. And again, they had to have during within normal limits, no threshold greater than um, 20 dB and no history of tinnitus or significant recurrent tinnitus. Um, if they were otherwise healthy, they could be randomized to one of four study arms, placebo, and three active doses, 200, 400, or 600 twice daily for four days. So acute treatment, it started before and continued during and after noise. This was a very intense clinical trial. Colleen had done the audiogram in two dB steps and at screening and baseline and uh, continued it for uh, four times post calibrated sound challenge and two times after that. So we did eight audios over a 10 to 14 day period. And what we were looking for was a slight TTS that would peak typically at about four kilohertz and that would resolve within hours to 24 hours and that one week would no look, look no different than baseline. So we felt this uh, calibrated sound challenge was safe. It was pre-recorded music, four hour duration at a set intensity with Edemotic 3A insert earphones. So this addressed many of the issues that the FDA had with acute noise. How will you control for the noise exposure, intensity, duration? use and misuse of hearing protective devices, distances from the sound source. So it's really a closed system, but we saw a significant amount of asymmetry. Uh, some years shifted most at four, some at three, some at six. Uh, some shifted the most uh, within 15 minutes post, some an hour and 15 minutes post. So even though it was a closed system, there was a little bit of noise. So on slide seven, um, because of Colleen's baseline work, we knew the peak shift would be at about four kilohertz. It would be uh, at the first post sound TTS period, uh, 15 minutes post. And so we wanted to reduce that by at least 50%. An active group would be at least 50% below the placebo group. And the 400 mig group showed that we had some secondary endpoints. So we averaged three, four, and six kilohertz shift, and then four, six, and eight, and then all eight frequencies from 250 down to 800. So we had different doses showing uh, effective reductions versus placebo. Then we did a post hoc analysis where we scored each year, each frequency, and looked for a 10 dB shift from baseline. And we saw two um, effective doses there. And um, this was our first multi dose study involving an affected population, and it's found to be uh, safe. This next slide shows you some of the uh, incidents of TTS over those first post uh, CSC time points. So at 15 minutes, through one hour, 15 minutes, through two hour, 15 minutes, and three hour, 15 minutes. The placebo rate goes from a 60% incidence of that STS, a 10 dB shift at at least one tested frequency. And then it resolves to 30% over time. And by 24 hours, it'll get down to about 5%. And each of the active groups were significantly less, or there were some statistical comparisons that were not statistically significant, but we felt they were still clinically relevant. And again, it was a little noisy. Um, at sometimes the 200 mid group looked very effective, at sometimes the 600 mid group looked the most effective. There really weren't many, if any, statistically significant differences between the doses. So this next slide summarizes what we've been doing in Meniere's disease. Historically, it's been considered a disease of vertigo with the reclassification in 2015. 
at least for the probable diagnosis, dizziness is allowed. Uh, patients no longer need to exhibit severe vertigo for the probable diagnosis. Importantly, uh, clinicians need to document low frequency hearing loss. And then uh, obviously uh, tinnitus, uh, potentially oral fullness, um, are other classic criteria. As the House Institute is well aware, being a leader in the study of Meniere's disease, uh, it's medical management unless patients progress with severe vertigo requiring an unrepeated procedure or strategy. So on this next slide, here are the refined criteria. Certain and possible were eliminated. Definite was um, further restricted such that um, vertigo should not go beyond 12 hours. And um, low frequency hearing loss needs to be documented uh, with probable, uh, again, dizziness is now qualifying and it has an upper time limit of 24 hours. So in our Meniere's disease studies, we've been using pure tone audiometry in the conventional range. We've been using a speech discrimination test uh, modified by Rich Wilson, the words and noise test, 35 monosyllabic words at seven different SNRs to each year. Every five unique words are then stepped down to where the SNRs approach the multi-talker babel. What we love about this uh, method is that, you know, we're testing a highly asymmetric study pop. Uh, some patients are in their 30s, some patients are in their 70s, and we see really a lack of floor and ceiling effects. Uh, many of our affected patients, their affected ear scores 10 or 12 out of 35 words correct, but the unaffected ear scores uh, 24 to 25 words correct. So we can use one test to discriminate or test both ears. We're also using the TFI. Uh, we're also focusing on question two, which is akin to the visual analog scale of rating your uh, tinnitus loudness over the last week. The vertigo symptom scale, um, this is the short form in, um, it asks you to um, rate your vertigo severity over the last month. And here's the consort flow for the phase 2B, a multi-center study done in the US. We screened 149 patients, excluded 20. Again, one of the critical factors here is that they needed that definite at screening rule-in diagnosis with low frequency hearing loss. In addition, uh, we didn't want dead ears. Um, so we had to exclude 20 subjects. Uh, we randomized 129. Three, we drew consent prior to taking uh, one dose of study drug, uh, but we did end up with an even allocation, um, N of 42 per study arm. So now we're testing placebo, 200 mg, 400 mg twice daily, times 28 days. We're falling for 56 days. In the phase 1B, we tested 200, 400, 600, like we did in the acute noise study. 600 was not found to be more effective, so we dropped it. Additionally, we had uh, non-significant improvements in the wind score, and we thought extending the dosing from three weeks to four weeks may help with that. And um, slide 15 just summarizes uh, some of the top line data. So this was our first multi-dose study where we treated patients for a whole month. It was our largest study to date. Um, we were looking for a relative improvement to placebo of at least 50% in the 200 or 400 mid group. What we found was that a 10 dB improvement at low frequency was uh, shown in the 400 mid group uh, eight weeks after the start of study drug. So at the end of study, uh, the active rate there was 61%. The placebo rate was high at 37%, but it was statistically significant using Fisher's exact test. 
And um, the 10% improvement in wind score was not significant, but bordered on significance <clears throat> at the two different follow-up time points. And then on slide 16, we showed um, the analyses of making the responder criteria more strict. So instead of just one low frequency improving 10 dB, two adjacent low frequencies improving by 10 dB, the 400 mg group has a responder rate of 39%. The placebo is now 20%. Um, if we double the responder criteria for the wind score from 10% improvement to 20%, now we see uh, a 68% rate versus 46. And then just saying, you know, scoring the ears independently for a forward improvement from baseline, the active group is 60%, the placebo group is 34%. What was important uh, to note is that the 200 mid group showed no significant improvements against placebo at any time point using any of these audiometric measures. So on slide 17, here's a graphical representation of some of these improvements. This includes all ears, affected and unaffected. On the first graph on the left, threshold improvement in dB from baseline at 250, 500, and 1,000. Low frequency pure tone average is also represented. And that little hash mark at 3 dB is what we would consider a clinically relevant change. Um, and only the 400 mig group shows that or approaches that. Uh, placebo and 200 do not. When we look at the wind score improvement on the y-axis, those are number of words and the two follow-up time points. Only the 400 mid group looks um, clinically relevant. And then the right figure shows tinnitus loudness improvement. So most patients come in and score at about a 6, 6.5. So we thought a one-point reduction was clinically relevant. So in this case, we did measure uh, the TFI at two weeks after the start of study drug. Uh, you can see that the um, placebo rate is 0. 0.5. The 200 mid group is about 0. 0.7. The 400 mid group is approaching one, but is not at one. Uh, at day 28, the 200 and 400 mid group are significant and clinically relevant. And then 28 days later, the 200 mg uh, level has resolved um, or gotten closer to baseline, uh, but the 400 mg group appears durable. This next analysis on slide 18 are when we um, uh, analyze the affected ears, the ears that started off with that low frequency hearing loss. And as you can imagine, they improved more so the same analysis is, is here, but just affected ears. So the um, violet bars representing 400 mig are, are improving, uh, approaching almost a 5 dB improvement at some of those low frequencies. Um, at day 56, the wind score uh, has improved on average almost three words which is significant, considering most of them start off at about 11. And then uh, tinnitus loudness improvement, that doesn't lateralize to one ear or another. The TFI doesn't call for that, so that analysis is unchanged. What we've been finding is a very strong inverse correlation between hearing thresholds on the y-axis and wind score on the x-axis. Uh, here's Pearson's coefficient, all ears, over time, baseline, one month, two month. And there's a strong inverse correlation. And then uh, if we do that same analysis, you know, restricting it to affected ears, uh, it's still a strong inverse correlation. So um, as I've mentioned here at the AAS, uh, there's no evidence of hidden hearing loss. <laughs> using uh, pure tone audiometry and the words and noise test. In this uh, older affected asymmetric study pop, which is 
pretty significant, I think, as a finding. And then here's an individual example from the phase 2B study, a 55-year-old male randomized to the 400 mid group in right ear, left ear, uh, three time points, baseline 28, 56 days. The wind score is in the box. And it's the right ear that makes this uh, patient many years. You can see their low frequency threshold started at 45, 60, uh, 55. They're actually kind of poor at two and three. Wind score was at nine. And after 28 days of treatment, they've had a significant improvement in their low and mid frequency thresholds. Their uh, wind score has more than doubled. And then uh, 28 days later, at end of study, they're still improved uh, with a 15, 10, 10 at low frequencies. Uh, in fact, two months later, this patient would not qualify for the study based on the right ear low frequency thresholds. The wind score has gone up even further from 2023. 20, the left ear looks pretty stable. Um, that's what we've seen in most uh, quote unquote unaffected ears. Sometimes the wind score is a little noisy, but we typically have test retests within one to two words. And on slide 22 is their demographic. Uh, they were diagnosed with many years, uh, six years earlier. And um, they have a, a bunch of metabolic disease and are on some chronic meds. And their TFI score at baseline was 82, it went down to 14. Tindus loudness was nine, it went down to three. And vertigo symptom scale was 32 and went down to zero. This, this patient had a really life altering effect being on this study drug. And then on slide 23, interestingly, about one third of our enrollees showed bilateral involvement. First, um, it was highly asymmetric. So the left ear here just qualified because it had uh, a 30 dB HL at 250 at baseline. Um, the right ear looks terrible. I mean, uh, coming in at 75 dB across low frequencies. Two kilohertz is at 70. Um, it almost looks like a sudden sensory neural hearing loss. I mean, you do have this kind of peak or improvement at three and four, so it's not a flat out angle. But um, it was impressive to see this patient improve and how dramatically they improved over one month of treatment and two months of follow-up. The wind score went from 11 to 22 to 18. The left ear, interestingly, had a significant improvement in their wind score from 20 to 27, uh, which is remarkable. And here's his demographic, a 47-year-old male, more recently diagnosed, 1.5 years into their disease. They had uh, improvements in all the patient-reported outcomes, but not as dramatic as that unilateral example I just presented. So our um, STOP MD3 Meniere's disease study is enrolling. Uh, we just provided a seven-month enrollment update. We um, have consented 160 patients, which is ahead of schedule. We're pleased that the House Institute, the House Clinic, is now part of our Meniere's disease uh, trial and is enrolling. And uh, based on the two additional sites we brought up, we only brought up 12 sites. Um, we thought we were going to bring up 16, but the first four sites that open to enrollment in um, very end of July and August, just kept pushing and saying, we want to enroll more. So we're letting them enroll more. Uh, one of our sites has now consented 40 subjects. And they were a lead enroller in our phase 2B. But to do that within uh, seven months is, is quite impressive. So we're going to learn three significant things from this stop MD3 trial. One, do we have enough safety and efficacy data to support acute treatment in definite many years? Two, the FDA asked us to expose 300 people to six months of open label extension and 100 people to 12 months 
they felt this drug could be used, quote unquote, intermittent, chronically, or chronically. So they wanted the safety data. We don't need the efficacy data, but every three months while on open label extension, we'll be repeating all the auditory vestibular assessments. Um, and we'll be looking at the affected ear and the unaffected ear. Because many of the patients with the quote unquote unaffected ear have high frequency hearing loss. And it's our hope that uh, Epsilon could be useful in age-related hearing loss. So we are um, expanding XUS in Korea, Japan, Germany, and Austria. And we are just about to open our first expanded access program to enroll uh, potentially 100 patients to achieve more safety data. And I think a very rigorous and ethical way Expanded access is not required as a program. It is required as a policy, but uh, the FDA does provide protections to the sponsor. The idea is that you don't uh, inhibit your ability to do registration trials uh, because the expanded access doesn't involve a placebo comparator. It's not a trial, but we are running it like a study, an open legal extension study. So on slide 27, uh, this summarizes from left to right uh, what we've completed in the phase 1B, phase 2B, and what's ongoing in the phase 3A study. We have thrown in the uh, dizziness handicap inventory and the oral fullness scale as potential outcome measures. Um, the vertigo symptom scale has not shown clinically relevant improvements. Uh, in the active groups versus placebo. So we think the dizziness handicap inventory may be more sensitive to disequilibrium. And many of our patients with unilateral involvement would literally point to an ear and say, I felt your drug was effective because within two to three weeks of taking it, I saw less pressure on the side that uh, was affected. So now we'll just switch gears to what we call our chemo protection program. This involves Epsilon and potentially allopurinol and other compounds that may synergize and have an improved um, autoprotective potential. Um, we are focusing on aminoglycosides and cisplatin. We have uh, published uh, a couple of papers in lab models of cisplatin ototoxicity. These figures come from a publication where we uh, created in an immunocompetent rat two syngenic solid tumor models, ovarian and breast. And we then split our cisplatin dose into three weekly cycles. So we wanted to mimic more of a clinical uh, treatment versus hitting the animals once with a high dose of cisplatin. Again, they were immunocompetent and they had two <clears throat> aggressive forms of solid tumors that would result in the course of three to four months in a, a significant amount of uh, lethality. So in the um, upper graphic, we see ABR threshold shifts. The control bars in black show just cisplatin plus vehicle. And in these two different cancer models, we saw significant reductions in those threshold shifts, especially at high frequency, 16 and 24. And then we saw some <clears throat> less robust improvements in the um, wave three latencies. <clears throat> Again, this plan is not, not only toxic to hair cells, but can injure the nerve and result in a reduction in uh, the ABR waveform, uh, both uh, amplitude and latencies. And the cytochochleogram analysis of our hair cells reveals a significant level of loss in the controls that we see platinum and vehicle only, and the autoprotected animals had much less um, high frequency of hair cell loss. So on slide 30, this work has been um, replicated by independent groups. This is a mouse model uh, with no tumor. But they did some lovely experiments, both in vitro and in vivo, 
Again, Epsilon protects the whole body. They showed improvements in weight loss, and that was actually one of the uh, nice objective measures that Epsilon was being photoprotective. Uh, animals have better weight maintenance. The cisplatin protocol here is not only ototoxic, but it can be lethal. And once animals lose about 30% of their body weight, you start to see them uh, uh, die from it. And then in culture, co-administration of epsilon was highly uh, autoprotective against cisplatin. And we've seen that as well. Uh, we've now um, done uh, a substantial amount of work in several mouse models of aminoglycoside ototoxicity, both in vitro and in vivo using epsilon at doses well below tobramycin, both in culture and in live animals. And these are the ABR threshold shifts, 56 days post, and there's significant bone protection um, at multiple frequencies. We then, um, on slide 32, looked at those individual frequencies and now scored each year using a, a modified ASHA criteria. So this is ABR on mouse. So we did keep the 20 dB shift from baseline. Uh, then we modified the second criteria and said a 15 dB shift at two contiguous frequencies. And then um, finally a 10 dB shift at three contiguous frequencies and scored each year. And you can see that with tobramycin only, um, using two or three criteria, we, the majority of animals or ears show the shift and a significantly lower number show that with epsilon co-administration. We've also done the same with amicacin. Um, in some respects, epsilon may be better uh, against amicacin-induced ototoxicity. We can clearly uh, uh, have effective ototoxicity with doses that are uh, one twentieth to one twenty fifth the dose of amicacin. And on slide thirty four, what's interesting about tobramycin and, and more so with amicacin is if you look at some psychophysical responses to startle a modified pre-pulse inhibition gap detection. You see evidence in a small subset, about 25 to 30% of the animals. You see a, an induction of what we think is tinnitus, changes in gap detection. But in a smaller subset, you see this heightened response to the startle reflex. It's greater than their baseline response. And when you do the acoustic startle, over time, the animals habituate. They don't become more reflexive, they become less reflexive. But what was interesting here is that in some animals, it exceeded baseline. Now we haven't seen this to date in our noise-induced tinnitus models with the same age animals. We are doing a, another study with older animals to see if there's anything there, but uh, we have some evidence of what we're calling hyperacusis, the animals have a greater startle reflex uh, to sound than they did at baseline. It's uh, significantly greater. And we've been enrolling a cystic fibrosis uh, clinical trial for uh, several years now. Uh, it's a complex trial where we did uh, two parts. We completed part one, which involved uh, six patients to look for a drug-drug interaction between epsilon and IV tobramycin, we didn't see one. And then 20 subjects uh, were studied over time after receiving um, at least a 10-day course of IV tobramycin, 10 days per week per day. So this summarizes what we completed in a publish, the Sentinel PK and the phase one B observational. The part one observational enrolled 20 subjects with acute pulmonary exacerbation. They're now requiring 10 mg per kg IV tobramycin. And we piggybacked on something called STOP2 protocol, which was supposed to randomize patients to 10, 14, or 21 days. What we found is that 
Well, they were close. Uh, four of our subjects uh, received 11 to 12 days, 11 subjects received 13 to 15 days, and three subjects received 21 to 22 days. Two subjects are not included in this analysis in that they um, didn't satisfy that uh, 10 mg per gig per day requirement, or they discontinued uh, IV tobramycin before 10 days. Uh, there were more females than males, and a significant number of ears came in with baseline hearing loss. The average age was 31. So this table summarizes their uh, responder analysis, their change from baseline. Uh, we did two follow-up time points, two and four weeks after the last infusion of IV tobramycin. So using ASHA criteria in the conventional audiogram, about a third of those subjects shifted. Uh, we then used uh, Stephen Fausti's SRO protocol, Donna Conrad, Martin, and Kelly Rivas have extended that. And as you would imagine, in the upper octave of hearing, they have even more shift. And the combination of extended high frequencies and the conventional audiogram puts them at about 90% shifted. Uh, at these two follow-up time points. We looked at changes in DP amplitude between four to eight kilohertz. God Almaki had demonstrated that this was the more sensitive range for changes in the DP gram. Um, we looked at uh, decreases in the words and noise test score uh, by 10% or more, and 40% of those patients showed that. The TFI, I think these are non-significant changes. You know, they're either single digit or low double digit and vertigo symptom scale. Again, that's uh, single digit. Yeah, we, we showed this audiogram to demonstrate that with as little as 11 days of IV tobramycin, you can have a ASHA level shift. Um, what's interesting here is how asymmetric it is. The right ear shifted uh, at multiple frequencies with um, one of the biggest shifts uh, between 12 to 14 kilohertz. And that's something else that's interesting. It's not the highest frequencies we can test that shift first. You know, a patient may have very good thresholds at uh, 18 and 20 kilohertz. They shift most and first at 12 and 14. It's very interesting. Their wind score went down a little bit over time from 27 to 25. I don't know if that's really relevant. The left ear, well, this is a massive noise notch, obviously. Uh, and then they have this little dip out at 14, but uh, their wind score went from 29 to 24 to 22. So a seven word reduction uh, is significant. And then we just presented this at ARO. It's a blinded, blended interim analysis. We were looking to enroll 80 subjects. We've enrolled 40 now. The pandemic heavily affected that. Many of these CF patients were told to stay away from clinic. In addition, the launch of Trikafter has reduced the incidence of pulmonary exacerbation requiring IV tobermycin. So we really struggled to get this 40th person in. Um, we screen failed or lost a follow of uh, five. So 35 were randomized. Again, this is much like our um, initial noise and mirror studies where we're testing placebo in pre-active groups. We're treating for 21 days. Essentially, we're chasing their IV tobermycin. They'll present to clinic, let's say, on Tuesday with a pulmonary exacerbation. We'll get them uh, consented for the study on a Wednesday as they're getting their pick line. We'll hopefully get the audios done on Thursday so we can randomize them on Friday. So many of these patients are being randomized to study drug uh, two days after they started their IV tobermycin. So the baseline is within 48 hours of the start of IV tobramycin, which I think is acceptable. And then we're treating for 21 days. Everyone's being treated for 21 days, uh, independent of how long they received IV tobramycin. Obviously, we're qualifying the analysis 
patients who uh, were treated for at least 10 days. And if we look at the part two interventional, again, this is blinded blended. This is in 27 patients where we had uh, completed data that had been source data verified. Uh, this demographic looks very similar to the part one demographic. Uh, part one was 29, uh, 31 years of age. This is 29. Uh, part one uh, was treated for 14.8 days, and this group was treated for 14 plus days. Um, they look very similar. Uh, their baseline level of hearing loss in both parts is uh, in the high 30s, 38, 39%. So what we note at two weeks is a high incidence of ototoxic change or cochlear toxic change, 37%. 84% combining the SRO. Uh, but at four weeks, uh, it goes down. So 37% becomes 14%. And the overall change goes from 84% to 59%. The um, emissions are still high, or the changes in the DP gram are still significant. The words and noise tests may be um, lower. It's not 40%, it's 25%. And again, the patient reported outcome measures weren't that significant in either group. And this graph um, gives you the incidence rates of both part one, which is completed, and part two that is ongoing side by side. So the green bars are the part one incidence and the blue bars are the part two. So two weeks post the last infusion of IV tobramycin, those incidences in the conventional audiogram, SRO, the entire audiogram, autoacoustic emissions, they look relatively similar. Uh, maybe the change in the DP gram is, there may be something there in the part two interventional, the change in wind score is identical. Uh, but four weeks post, there's this divergence now. So uh, in the observational, those, those losses are maintained or go up a little bit. With regards to the ongoing part two interventional, they're going down, they're diverging. So we, we feel confident that the drug is well tolerated. We haven't had a single drug-drug interaction or death due to drug, or even a severe adverse event that we think is due to study drug. To um, in very, very similar study pops at the same clinical trial sites, we are seeing this divergence, at least with regards to the part two interventional. And then finally, here's a summary table showing all the studies that uh, have tested SPI 1005. And uh, Top to bottom, what we've completed over the years in um, orange there, what's ongoing, and in gray, what we will initiate by the end of the year. So uh, by the end of this year, we will have enroll, enrolled over 1,000 people in an SPI 1005 trial. And when we started enrolling the STOP MD3 trial at the very end of July, seven months ago, I surveyed all of clinicaltrials.gov, and we were the only active phase three trial testing an investigational new drug in a hearing loss or tinnitus indication. Given the failure of um, autonomy's recent trials and frequencies trials, we are the only phase two or phase three interventional clinical trial testing a, a new drug. Everything else is uh, preclinical or um, trying to emerge from the phase 1A or phase 1B studies. So that's it. Uh, that's the summary of SPI 1005's um, research and development.